good. Uh, so um, let's just pick up where we um, left off uh, uh, yesterday. So um, let me just give you a quick uh, um, a reminder of where we are. I, again, I've, I, in, in this set of slides, I've also uh, borrowed and stolen shamelessly from my colleagues, so I just have wanted to glance So here was the outline I set out for myself um, uh, for this series of lectures. And uh, you can see where we talked about interferometers. We talked a great deal about uh, optical cavities or ferroperal cavities. I hope you guys know what they are now because they're going to continue to feature importantly in and uh, in in the in my lectures today. Uh, we talked a little bit about how we we quantify noise and and, and in terms of uh, power spectra and amplitude spectral densities. We talked at length about seismic noise and thermal noise. Those were uh, that's where we left off. And then uh, today I'm going to actually spend most of the day on on quantum noise and quantum technologies. And then towards the end, I'll say a little bit about third generation detectors. And I'm going to wrap up by taking us for, uh, to the future and back to the present and with what's going on in, in, in LIGO and Virgo right now. All right? So that's the, uh, that's the plan. Um, here is a layout of the LIGO interferometers. And now I've actually added here a few uh, details that you should feel a little bit more, more comfortable uh, seeing. Yeah, the laser is, 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 is indeed at the input. There's a bunch of optical cavities at the input to, uh, to clean up the light. This is the power recycling cavity right here. The mirror here and the beam splitter form that. Two Fabry-Perot cavities in, in the arms. Each of these mirrors, particularly the mirrors of the arm cavity, so the four mirrors of the, of the two fabric perros are, are uh, isolated with an active seismic isolation system. Remember that and uses feedback control. And then a passive isolation system, which is a chain of pendulums. Um, and then there, uh, at the output here is where we make the measurement. And I said briefly, I talked about the signal recycling mirror, which basically just sends the signal photons back in for to gather more phase. Okay, so that's kind of I think the summary of everything we talked about uh, uh, yesterday. Now you've seen this plot too in uh, before. Uh, these are the expected noise sources for advanced LIGO, and I really want to zoom in today on the quantum noise, which is the magenta curve. And you can see there's good reason to do that. If you look at the black curve, which is the total noise, the so sum of all these noises in uh, for advanced LIGO, it is more or less completely dominated by the quantum noise, which is the magenta curve. A little bit right here around 80 hertz, the, the coding thermal noise uh, um, matters, but everywhere else. So it's a very important noise source, and one we have to solve if we want to do better. And so today's lecture is going to be about what causes this noise source and how do we, how we, how do, we do better, OK? So uh, to be able to do this, I have to give you a little bit of a, uh, uh, a tutorial on how we quantize light. So I'll, I'll do that uh, uh, to start with. So the first thing we do in quantizing light is we start with a classical field. And this classical field is you can just write it in terms of sines and cosines. And in, embedded in, in, the, in the R vector is all the, the spatial dependence of the light as well. So you, that's a, a completely generic way to write this uh, kind of light field, and this is sometimes called a quadrature field. And anytime you see the word quadrature, you should know it simply means expressing something in terms of sines and cosines. Okay? Uh, and now, as a simple exercise, you can su superpose on this time-varying field another uh, field uh, with, with this amplitude, E0. When the total field will be the sum of these three fields. And the sum of these three fields, then you can see quickly, you can rewrite as a a term, that's the mo a modulation of amplitude. And another term, oh, that should be an E2, sorry. Uh, that's a, just a, a LaTeX typo. Another term, that's a modulation of phase. Okay, So you can think, the reason why I put this up is you can think interchangeably between quadrature fields and amplitude and phase. And this is nothing new. This is something you would, we would do with any classical uh, light field or electromagnetic wave already. 
Okay, now comes the quantizing part. So the basis of quantizing an electromagnetic field, some of you have, have, have seen this before, so this is a re recap, and some of you may not have even thought about it. The basis of quantizing a, uh, an, an electromagnetic field is really to do with the idea that you can express the, the, uh, the modes of, the, uh, of an electromagnetic field as if they were the modes of, an, uh, of a cavity. So think about the, your original thoughts on black body radiation. You have a cavity. It can support some number of modes in, a, in, in, in that box. And then what happens is the boundary conditions of that box or that cavity are very similar to any boundary value problem you would do, such as a harmonic oscillator problem. So what you will see again and again is in quantizing a light field, just think of the quantum harmonic oscillator. So even if you've never quantized a light field, you have quantized a harmonic oscillator, at least most of you must have. So you'll see that these operators, uh, 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 we call them x1 and x2, and they're expressed in terms of these operators that are raising and lowering operators, sometimes known as ladder operators. And I want you to just recall that if you've ever quantized the, the, the uh, harmonic oscillator, these relationships should remind you very much of the P and Q operators that you use in quantizing a, 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 a harmonic uh, oscillator, P and Q in this be, case being the canonical position and momentum. So if you think about a Hamiltonian that's often written as a so a, a Hamiltonian that could be written something as p squared over 2m plus omega naught squared uh, uh, q squared. That's a that's the, the uh, har uh, harmonic oscillator, quantum harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. And then, if you recall, you could express p and q in terms of of uh, raising and lowering operators. So that's all I've done here. Okay. Now you take those and you can you then you can uh, 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 quant uh, express the field in terms of these laser, uh, these uh, uh, quadrature operators. We call them again quadrature operators because there's a very important like quantum differences. I'm not going to go deep into the quantum mechanics here. Either you've, you've, you've had it or not, because some of, most of the rest of my lecture I'm going to do much more intuitively and pictorially. But the important things to know are x1 and x2 act like amplitude and phase. X1 and X2 are Hermitian. The latter operators are not, and therefore, when you want to have observables, you have to observe in units of X1 and X2. But and being an experimentalist, I only observe in terms of observables, and therefore, I will work with X1 and X2. Okay. Now, the raising and lowering operators, uh, if you recall, simply act on a number state. If in the case of the harmonic oscillator, it was quantizing just the 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 uh, energy levels of the uh, of the harmonic oscillator, these were the, the, the number states. In the case of, of light, these are basically a photon number. N here refers to a state with some number of photons. These photon number states are sometimes called Fox states. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, they don't uh, occur naturally in nature. People have only in the last decade or so succeeded in making Fox states in a lab, but they're, they're, they're very uh, mathematically very convenient, uh, but they're not uh, uh, something that light naturally occurs in. Okay? So, that's, so that sets up our, uh, our, um, uh, our math, I think, here. Do we have anything else? Now we move away from this. As soon as I introduce x1 and x2 as my quadrature operators, I give you the, 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 their commutation relation. I can immediately express that now in terms of a Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle. Because of this commutation relation, they are, they are complementary variables. And from here on, you can forget everything I said about this, because now all you have to know is that x1 is, 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 refers to amplitude, and x2 refers to phase of a light field that's quantized. Okay? And now we can have much more intuitive thoughts about this by looking, uh, by, by looking at a phase space representation. So here's a phase space representation of x1 uh, on the horizontal axis and x2 on the vertical axis. And now you can see any light field can be expressed as the following. You take a laser field, and that's this blue arrow here. This, and what it has is it has an amplitude but that's given by the length of the, the stick. And it has a phase that's given by the angle of the stick. And that's your classical light field. If you had no quantization, you would be done. This phaser would rotate at frequency omega, which is the frequency of the field, and that, that would be your description. 
But of course, quantum mechanics blurs the tip of this phaser. You cannot have know the the uh, the amplitude and phase. Uh, um, uh, with um, uh, exquisite precision, and in fact, here is the uncertainty relation from Heisenberg that that results from that commutation in relation I, uh, I wrote, and that means basically you have a a fuzzball at the tip of your arrow. Okay, it simply says I cannot measure with with uh, with exquisite precision the tip of this fuzzball. Okay, and furthermore, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle also tell, gives a minimum area uh, uh, to the ball, and that minimum area is this re re relation here. Okay, so the, if you if you are uh, think in terms of a quantum uh, oscillator, this is exactly the same thing we do there. This is simply just this would be the uncertainty relationship between the mo uh, canonical momentum and 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 position, or even real p momentum and position. Okay, so that uh, that's the, the the thing. And if you like none of the math, just know this. Quantum mechanics says you cannot measure the amplitude and phase of light simultaneously with in infinite precision. Okay, if you like none of the rest of it, that's the message. But there's a little bit more to this. So now we're going to work entirely in this phase space representation of x1 and x2. And once you do that, here are some quantum states of light. So the one on the top left is a coherent state. And that it turns out that is a laser. A laser basically has a, 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 an amplitude and a phase. And it has a minimum uncertainty if it is a shot noise or quantum noise limited laser. Okay, So that's what a laser state is. Now comes the next and perhaps most important uh, um, state that we're going to work with, and that's a vacuum state. So, you know, given that this is almost the last lecture of the series and you're all tired, I thought I would just kind of blow your minds away, you know. So, here's the mind blowing part. So, what is the vacuum state? The vacuum state is the zero point energy fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. So you can think of it arising from everywhere, all around us, even in empty space. Particles and antiparticles are creating and annihilating. And in that process of creating and annihilating, they have, there's an, a, a bath of minimum energy that's called a vacuum state. And it's a vacuum, it's a randomly fluctuating field. So in the, in the case, in, in thinking about the quantization of light, when you think about a harmonic oscillator, what the lowest state, the ground state of the quantum harmonic oscillator, remember the energy is given by n plus a half h bar omega, right? So if you recall, if you quantize the energies of a, of a, of a uh, quantum harmonic oscillator, you get something that looks like uh, n plus 1 half h bar omega, right? So, and where n goes from 0 to, to infinity, when n is equal to 0, you don't have 0 energy, right? And that's what the vacuum state is telling you as well. That's what it is. The quantization of the light mathematically because of this will tell you you always have some non-zero energy. And the physics of it is the, the annihilation uh, uh, and creation of virtual particles. So if you've never thought about this before, you will never forget this again. When you walk around this room, empty space, anywhere in space, Everywhere around you, there is a popcorn of vacuum, vacuum fluctuations. Popping in and out of existence are particles. And if you close your eyes, you should imagine them. Okay? Now, why is this state going to be so important? You'll see in a, in a, in a, in a, in a minute that even though it's, this, it's, sort of, it's such, an, um, uh, such a crazy idea, it shows up again and again in experiments. So, and I'll show you how. All right, then comes another very interesting state. So you can take a coherent state, and Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that you must have a minimum uncertainty where delta x1, delta x2 is greater than some normalized, in some normalized units, 1. Okay, you might be used to h bar, we just normalize that out in quantum optics. Now you. Uh, what Heisenberg says is that you must satisfy that relationship, um, but you can always redistribute the, the noise. So if you start with something that's delta x1 times delta x2 is greater than or equal to 1, the minimum uncertainty will say delta x, the uncertainty in x1 and the uncertainty in x2 are equal, which is what that coherent state shows over there. 
but there's nothing that stops you from making what's called a squeeze state, where you can preserve this relationship but put some noise from uncertainty from x2 into x1. And that's what these states are. These are different kinds of, of, of squeeze states where we simply redistribute the uncertainty between the two quadratures. Okay? And these are going to play an important role as well in our, uh, in, in, in our work today. Now, not only can you squeeze a coherent state, as is shown here, that's the, you know, when you have a, a stick, you can also squeeze a vacuum state. Okay? There's not, nothing in, 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 the, um, um, in the physics or the math that says you can't. Now, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because I want to try to explain to you where the quantum noise limit comes from. So let's first remind ourselves of what the quantum noise limit is. There it is. Now, if you recall, we already encountered shot noise. And shot noise is what limits the high frequency part of the spectrum, above about 100 hertz. And the way we make the shot noise lower is by using more laser power. Why? How does it scale? Everybody remember? Speak. Square root of power. Right? So it's a square root of the power. As I increase the power in the interferometer, my, my signal to noise ratio improves. And what I'm doing in, the, in quantum mechanical language is I'm with using more laser power, I'm making a stronger measurement. I'm making a more precise measurement in Heisenberg's language. Okay? Now, as I increase the laser power, uh, and, and make a more precise measurement, the momentum of the photons are now kicking my mirrors more. And that then is the radiation pressure noise, and that comes down at, on this, uh, at this end of the, of the spectrum. And that's a consequence of this stronger measurement. Uh, Heisenberg requires it. Heisenberg says, well, if you know the, this part too well, you must not know this part too well. Okay? And the reason, uh, very simply, that you can think of it in a heuristic way is that in this region uh, of the spectrum, we are measuring f uh, sensitive to phase fluctuations. And in this part of the spectrum, we're uh, sensitive to amplitude fluctuations. So this is just the Heisenberg uncertainty principle expressed in terms of amplitude and phase, but applied to an interferometer. Okay? So now you have sort of understood what the quantum noise problem is. The quantum noise problem isn't just one of, oh, photons are quantized, use more power, life will be better. It's one of, light is quantized, use more photons, and pay a price somewhere else, because Heisenberg always makes you pay a price. Okay? So what are we going to do about this? So let's see, how does this even, to, to see how this noise comes about, we have to see how it applies to an interferometer. So now you guys are very well equipped to analyze uh, interferometers. So let's take a look. So my, I'm going to ask you my first question to you, now that you're interferometer experts, is you already told you we operate the interferometer on a dark fringe, which means there should be, in principle, no light coming out here. I already told you the answer to the next question, but let me see if you remember, where does the light go? It goes back to the laser. Now let me ask you a question. If there's noise on the laser, where does that go? Should, because uh, as far as an electro, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the field is concerned, it doesn't know it's, it's a laser field or a noise field. So it goes back to the laser. But by that argument, then I should be able to make a perfectly noise-free measurement out here. Do I? Can I? You're silent because you know there's something wrong with this idea. But if you lived in a classical world, that is the only conclusion you could come to, is that in fact you would make a noise-free measurement, right? Because whatever the noise was that was associated with the laser should go back to the laser. But we no longer live in a classical world. Now you are armed with this new understanding of the world, which is that vacuum fluctuations are everywhere. And in a quantum system, any time you have an open port, the electromagnetic vacuum leaks in. That's what it does. So let's look at how it does that. So you can see that in this beam splitter, in the classical beam splitter, you would just have a, a light going in this way, and, and it, it reflects, uh, uh, and it sort of splits up to uh, this mirror here and to this mirror here. In the classical description of the beam splitter, you don't just have the laser field coming in here. You have a vacuum field coming in here. Okay. 
All right. When that vacuum field comes in, I already told you about the symmetry of the beam splitter and the, and the change in sign. For the same reason that the, the light laser field goes back to the laser, by the symmetry of the beam splitter, this vacuum field will come back out at, the, at, the vacuum, at this output here. But what also comes out over here is this little red signal phaser. When the gravitational wave comes by and moves these mirrors differentially, it's a little bit of the light leaks out, and there it is. And now it superposes on the vacuum field. And that is the origin of the shot noise. Okay? So it really doesn't matter what the noise on the laser is. What matters is how much power you have, because the superposition depends on the length of your little signal vector here. Okay? So this is a formula for, for shot noise. It has an h bar and a c, and then there's the squ uh, square root of power and, and, uh, in, in the denominator, just as, as I showed you yesterday. And so what shot noise is, is it's the coherent signal field, a little red vector, superposed on the quantum uh, fluctuations that are coming in, the vacuum fluctuations that are coming into the open port. Okay. Now, what about the radiation pressure? Well, it's actually the same thing. These same vacuum fields, this yellow, the yellow, yellow vectors, are going up to, to the, the, each mirror and superposing on with this very intense light field, the red vector here. And so for the same reason, the radiation pressure noise also comes from the coherent superposition of the intracavity field uh, with the vacuum state. Okay? And it's, it's that fluctuating amplitude fluctuation that kicks the mirror and gives you the, the, the noise, okay? And that's what you get for the displacement sensitivity uh, due to radiation pressure. Now, this thing has a, a 1 over m times f squared in there. What it, the hell is that? Um, some of you might have noticed, and some of you might not have, because I haven't said explicitly. Um, yesterday, I showed you what an, uh, uh, a classical a, a harmonic oscillator, not a quantum oscillator, but a classical uh, harmonic oscillator. I showed you yesterday that it has a displacement per force spectrum that looks like this, right, as a function of frequency. So this is the 1 over f squared part, and that's simply just saying that when I apply a force, the radiation pressure is a force. But really, I'm interested in displacement, and so the force per displacement has that 1 over f squared term in there. That's where it comes from. It has a mass in there as well. It just comes from the solution to the, different, the, the harmonic oscillator equation. Okay? So that's where it comes from. So that now tells you something important about, uh, about how the, these fields would look in the spectrum of, of, the, uh, 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 of the output of the Michelson interferometer. So actually, let me do that in a, in a, in a yeah, let me do that next. So let me just try to put this into, into a slightly different language. Uh, here are your E1 and E2. These are the two quadratures, amplitude and phase. And you, as you know, shot noise is just it's the minimum uncertainty. It's in both, it's in both uh, quadratures equally. The gravitational wave signal shows up in the phase quadrature. It shows up in the phase quadrature for the reasons that we talked about yesterday, where the, the, it, we're at the place uh, in you know, the output of the, the here is a fabry perot cavity. And the fabry perot cavity has a, 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 its power goes like this, and its phase has its maximum slope right here. So this is in the phase quadrature that we make the signal measurement. So it adds, the signal then adds, the little gravitational wave signal adds only to the phase quadrature. Now, without radiation pressure, this is your picture. But now if you had radiation pressure, something else rather dramatic happens. And this is something really, this is going to be a building block of many things we talk about. So this is a moment to, to, to wake up. What does the radiation pressure do? The radiation pressure, what it does is it takes amplitude fluctuations, whatever they are, and turns out in this case to be due to the shot noise. And those amplitude fluctuations apply a force on the mirror. What does the mirror do? It moves. When the mirror moves, what happens to the phase of the light? It changes. So the radiation pressure takes an amplitude fluctuation and puts it into a phase fluctuation because of the motion of the mirror. And that correlates the amplitude and phase. Okay? 
So the movable mirror that was invented to be the free falling particles, uh, you know, test mass of general relativity has all these other ramifications. You know that that we have to now deal with in most optics experiments anywhere. Nobody has to think about the motion of the mirror because your mirror is just bolted down, and the radiation pressure is absolutely negligible compared to all the forces on it. Not so in gravitational wave detectors and in a few other experiments that I'll show you. But okay, so now you put this all together and you can look at a, at a, a spectrum just of the quantum noise. So. On the horizontal axis, again, I have frequency. And on the vertical axis, I have strain. And this is for a, a simple Michelson interferometer. This doesn't have fabric pearl cavities in it, because so much of this discussion, we want to not complicate it more than that. Each of these three colored curves, the, the blue, uh, two colored curves, the blue curve and the red curve, correspond to two different power levels. So here is the red curve. If you look at the red curve, it corresponds to a power level of 10 kilowatts. And you see that it has shot noise, which is flat. Remember, shot noise had a flat spectrum. And radiation pressure noise has the 1 over f squared spectrum. Okay? And, the, and, and, and the sum of those two is the, is the, is the uh, solid red curve. Now, if I want to do better on shot noise, I'll be tempted to, to, to turn my power up. So instead of 10 kilowatts, I, I go to, to a, um, a, a megawatt. And indeed, my shot noise level drops, but my radiation pressure noise comes up. And then the green curve is labeled the SQL. And that's another really interesting quantity. The SQL stands for the standard quantum limit. I'll tell you a few things about it, and we'll come back to it later. The first thing I'll tell you is it's neither standard nor is it a limit. Okay. Every field has their own standard quantum limit. This one happens to be ours. But what is it? It's actually asking a very, very profound question. It's asking, if I use light to measure the position of a particle, what is the best I can do? And that's this, this line limits that, right? It says, well, if I want to do better, I turn up the power. But then, oh, no, no, I can't do that because it'll get the make the radiation pressure worse. So it's a balance between those two things. And that's what the standard quantum limit is. Okay, so and uh, it turns out uh, the only reason I introduced the standard quantum limit is, like I said, we know how to do do, do better than that, and I'll show you. It's not really a limit, uh, but what it is is it's a benchmark. It's the benchmark of this, just that the limit where you where you've done you have the ordinary Heisenberg limit. It's what it's called. Okay, that's what it is. But we'll manipulate it and we'll get around it, and I'll show you how we do that in a while. But for the moment, that's that's what it is. Okay, so now how do we do better? That's the question, right? So beyond this quantum noise, we have to do some quantum engineering. And so um, back to the interferometer. You already know that the vacuum state comes in. The vacuum state comes out, superposes with the gravitational wave signal. And that gives us the, the, the quantum noise I showed you. Now imagine for a moment that instead of putting a vacuum state in here, I could put a squeezed state in here. What might that squeeze state look like? Might look like this, where the area of the ellipse is the same as the area of the original circle. So I'm not violating Heisenberg, but I'm redistributing the noise. That squeeze state goes into the interferometer and comes out. And now when it superposes along the signal vector, the noise is lower. right? Along the, the red arrow, the noise got smaller. The price to pay is that in the orthogonal direction along the long part of the ellipse, of course, the noise got worse. So I better not make a measurement along that direction. But as long as I'm making a phase measurement along the, the red arrow, and I make a squeeze state that's oriented in this direction, I should be able to do better. Any objections? Yes. Well, there'll be a price to pay. And I told you, Heisenberg never lets you get away with anything. But even that, we'll get around. I'll show you. OK. But that's true. But if you were only wanting to improve the shot noise, this is what you would do. OK. So indeed, we do that. We want to make a squeezed vacuum state. Are you holding onto the edges of your seats? Have you ever heard of something like that? Not just to take, not just the fact that we have these vacuum fluctuations, but we're going to go in a lab and squeeze them. 
Come on, you guys. It's pretty cool, isn't it? OK. All right. So how do we squeeze a photon state? So what do we need? We need to simultaneously de-amplify one quadrature, the noise in one quadrature, whilst amplifying the noise in the other quadrature. Remember, I can't use just an ordinary amplifier, because that amplifier will just make my whole circle of noise grow bigger, uh, 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 because it amplifies everything. We need what's called a, 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 a phase-sensitive or parametric amplifier that can increase the fluctuations in, 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 in phase or amplitude and decrease them in phase or amplitude or vice versa. So, so how should we do that? So here, by the way, is just a little definition of what, the, what these are. Here is your x1, x2 plane again. And here is the, the, the magenta is just your normal vacuum state. And the squeezing ellipse is defined here. It has an angle relative to the axis called theta, and it has an, a, a degree of squeezing which is given by the, this parameter r. So the one way you might do this is a very simple idea that you can wrap your head around. There, we have materials where the refractive index of the material depends on the amplitude uh, or of, the, of the field that's passing through it. So now you can play this trick of you pass your uh, a field through such a uh, material, and the amplitude fluctuations change the get, make fluctuations in the refractive index. The fluctuations in the refractive index make a fluctuations in phase, and you've correlated amplitude and phase. Remember, anytime you want to make uh, the, make, make make these correlations, you need something nonlinear to make the correlation. And this would be a correlator. So we have exactly such materials where we can indeed make uh, 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 have an output where where you you deamplify one quadrature and amplify the other quadrature by these by these correlations. Okay. So how does this work? So here would be the Hamiltonian for such a device, OK? So the Hamiltonian for such a device, now you're used to seeing raising and lowering operators. Uh, the thing you should always remember when you see these raising and lowering operators is they're acting on number states of photons. So really, in the lab, they're not that useful. They're useful for thinking about it. In the lab, we, we, we uh, uh, think about it in a much more complex formalism. I've also added here what A and B are. A and B are two laser fields. One is, is a, a green laser field, and the a, a, a B is a green laser field, and A is a red laser field that's at exactly double the wavelength. Okay, so it's, it's, it's uh, green is the more energetic field. And now you can take a look at this Hamiltonian, and you can see a few things. This quantity kappa is just a coupling constant. The first term describes a process called parametric oscillation. And what that is, is you take a single green phot photon, the B photon, and you annihilate it. Remember, that's a lowering operator. So you annihilate that to create two red photons. Okay, the raising operators create photons, uh, lowering operators annihilate photons. So this black box is your nonlinear material. You, you, uh, the green photon decays into two red photons. It's parametric oscillation. This term on this side is second harmonic generation, which says you put two red photons in, in here, and you create one green photon. Again, energy and momentum have to be conserved, and that's how this process would happen. So that's another term. Now, embedded in this Hamiltonian are many other processes that I, I won't talk about. There's parametric amplification, where you can take one red and one blue, uh, one red and one green, and make, make uh, uh, three reds. That's, uh, that's, that's a process by which lasing happens, for example. The thing you should know in this cartoon that I've made, because of this coupling constant kappa, the output photons are correlated. Okay? The, and the way the, to think about this is that these two red photons were born from a single quantum mechanical process. And so their, their properties are correlated, otherwise known as, in, in quantum language, entangled. Okay? So that's what we do. We use a device that can have a, 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 a Hamiltonian like this. This is what our experiment would look like. We start with a laser. We turn the red laser into green photons with a second harmonic generation. Then we take those green photons and put them into an optical par parametric oscillator process, so two nonlinear processes. And that this device here will put out squeezed vacuum state. 
Now you might be wondering how in all of this do I get a squeezed vacuum state, right? So you, I can convince you that I could make, a, you know, that these photons are, are, have correlated properties. So it turns out rather remarkably that again, nature is amazing. Nature doesn't know the difference between a, 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 a state with 100,000 photons or a vacuum state. If I can squeeze a coherent state, I simply dial down the number of photons. So you've seen from my ball and stick picture, what's the difference between a coherent state and a vacuum state? The arrow disappears. How do I make the arrow disappear? I just turn down the, 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 the intensity of the light until I have no more light left. So in the experiment, what we do literally is we start off by putting red photons in. You know, the green photons are required for, for, uh, for the nonlinear process. Normally, you would put red photons in as well. We do that. We set it all up. We align everything. We get all the measurement ready. And then we just block the red beam. Really? OK. And that squeezes the vacuum. So here is a more detailed version of that. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. This is the interferometer that I've shown you many times now. Here is a power recycling mirror. The, that's the laser input. And this is the output where we would measure the gravitational wave. This is this output photodiode is where the measurement is made. We want to squeeze the vacuum that's going in this open port. So here is our squeezed vacuum source. We, we inject the squeezed vacuum into the interferometer. And when we do that, we make a measurement like this. So this is a measurement that was done on LIGO's Hanford uh, uh, detector in 2011, right after initial LIGO ended and before advanced LIGO construction began. The red curve was the noise spectrum at the time. And the blue curve is what we got when we turned on our squeezer. Okay, and wh wh what you see is that right up to, up to about 150 hertz, you see improvement. Below 150 hertz, you see no improvement because the sonophrometer was not shot noise limited. It's so it's, it, this works where you have you had shot noise, it improved the shot noise and improved it by 25 percent. Also, uh, in you know, something we refer to as as uh, 2 dB in, in engineering units. Okay, so. We had already tried this in our labs. We knew it would work. And so you can see. So here, what you're seeing is the sensitivity of a shot noise limited interferometer being improved by injection of squeezed vacuum states. OK? All right. Now, why was it only 25% or 2 dB? It was 20, 25 percent is another important lesson that, for you to know as you think about quantum systems. Quantum states are fragile. It doesn't matter whether it's an optical state or a state of, 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 of phonons or, or, or atoms. Quantum states are fragile. And, uh, and they're fragile because every time you have a loss or an open port in your quantum system, what loves to sneak in to open ports? Vacuum. Vacuum sneaks into open ports, and therefore, every time you have a loss, your exquisitely narrow squeeze state is being superposed by the blobby vacuum state, and eventually your, your state just isn't squeezed anymore. So in that original experiment, we, had, we were generating, actually, a, a large amount of squeezing in the, in the squeezer itself, uh, but we could only achieve this 2 dB uh, result of squeezing because our losses were large. We were at 50% losses. By the time you take your squeeze state, send it into the interferometer, let it come back out, and detect it, the losses were too big. Now, our goal for advanced LIGO is to improve the losses down to, uh, to somewhere between 10 and 20% so that we can reach 6 dB of squeezing. Okay? So let me now fast forward to that. So within the last year, we now have installed uh, a, a squeezing in, in advanced LIGO. And here is the sensitivity curve of advanced LIGO during observing run three, which began just uh, in, in April this year. And the main improvements between the blue uh, curve, the, the only change between the blue curve and, and, the, and the red curve uh, is that they're squeezing. And so the impa impact of squeezing in this case is we have about a 3 dB improvement. 
not, not 2 dB, not the 6 dB we wanted, 3 dB. So we're still limited by losses, and that's a, that's a big challenge for us. Uh, but uh, the, this is the most significant improvement to be made uh, in advanced LIGO between observing run 2 and observing run 3. And the improvement is sufficient that in observing run 2, advanced LIGO was seeing roughly one event per month. In observing run 3, we're already seeing more than one per week. So this improvement is actually quite significant, even though it doesn't look very Im important uh, uh, you know, on a graph with this many uh, ma uh, orders of magnitude on it. OK? Yeah? Can you put my astrophysics hat back on? So reduce the noise by 10 percent. So you increase the distance, you can see your sources by several tens of percent. So the volume goes as several tens of one plus, that several tens of percent is huge. So yeah. Small improvements on that plot can be gigantic. This is, uh, this is more than a factor of two in volume already, because when you cube that, 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 that 3 dB, OK? So yes, thank you, Scott. Good. So, uh, so I think we can all uh, agree that this is uh, one piece of quantum engineering that has worked out well for, uh, for, uh, for gravitational wave detection. We are able to squeeze the, the, uh, you know, uh, the electromagnetic vacuum and make an improvement in sensitivity. Oh, <laughs> last year. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> no, that's right. Uh, look, I think uh, two things. A uh, couple of places we know where we have excess loss, and we can fix that. But we are measuring. Uh, we have uh, we can't find where the other losses are at the moment. So there's somewhere in our it's a very complex light path as you can imagine because uh, the squeezing goes from from a table into vacuum through maybe 30 different optical components, some of them active. So it's not an easy problem, but it's a solvable problem. So uh, I, I will I will say that probably by observing run four we'll have more than 3 dB. Maybe not all the way to 6, maybe 4 or 5. But we'll f we know some, some places where there are gains. But there's even more exciting things coming. So let me tell you about those. And then, and then you'll find that the losses are, yeah, they're a pain in the, in the ass, but that's OK. So here we go. All right, so now comes the part that you were worrying about. All right, so I just want to say one little thing here. Does anybody notice with the red curve what happens below about, about uh, 50 hertz? It got worse. Why? Maybe. We're still working on that. We don't know yet. We have to do many measurements to make sure this is not some other noise source. But it's we're, Scott asked me yesterday, are we, you know, when will we be there? I, w I think we might already be. But it's at the moment, it's not the dominant noise source. It's, it's about equivalent to the other noises there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's not. It's a little misleading because I haven't spoken at all about the fact that we don't have a pure state, so our anti-squeezing is larger than our squeezing. But uh, and I'm not going to. But uh, so, uh, but uh, but that's okay. All right. So here then is the advanced LIGO. Um, a, a target sensitivity, the blue curve. And now you are used to thinking about the idea that you have shot noise at high frequencies uh, and radiation pr uh, pressure noise at low frequencies. And if I put in a 6 dB of squeezing, indeed I will make an improvement in the shot noise. And as we all were worried, it would get worse at low frequencies. Because now the reason, of course, is that at this frequency, we would like to have squeezing that's along the phase quadrature. But at this frequency, we would like to have squeezing that's along the amplitude quadrature. And in between, we would like to have squeezing that's something in between. But our squeeze light source only puts out squeezing at a fixed orientation for the squeezing ellipse. And if we arrange that fixed orientation to be this one, then we pay the price at low frequencies. Okay? So of course, we have to do something about that. And we do. OK, so if you could do something about that, then you get the full benefit of, of having broadband improvement uh, with your, uh, with your sque squeezing. Of course, you never, you're never violating Heisenberg, because what you're doing is that at each frequency, you're redistributing the noise so that Heisenberg isn't violated. Right? So what we do now is the following. 
a slightly busy plot, but I want to show you something that now you're kind of used to. This is a, the response of a fabric perot cavity. That's what its amplitude looks like. That's what its phase looks like, just like this silly picture I drew here. When you take any light field and you either pass it through the cavity or reflect it from the cavity, because of this phase relationship, right around resonance, the cavity applies a phase shift to the light. So here is a laser field. I've just shown you a coherent state. That's, it starts there. And as it reflects off this cavity, it gets a phase shift because of this phase relationship. Nothing stops me from, instead of using a coherent state here, using a squeeze state and rotating the squeezing ellipse. And rotating it in a frequency dependent way. Remember, this is either if the length of the cavity is fixed, this is just a measure of the frequency of the light relative to the cavity resonance. So in a frequency dependent way, I can rotate the, the, uh, my light field. And that's what we do. We take our squeeze state. We pass it through a very special cavity right here. And then we inject it into the interferometer. OK, so that's it. Right? There's the squeeze light source. It goes through this cavity. So it turns into this frequency dependent rotated ellipse and then off to the interferometer. Uh, we haven't done that yet in LIGO. We did that in a laboratory test. And here is what we measure. So it's a very busy plot. I'm just going to walk you through it in a simple way. Here's frequency on the horizontal axis. And here is the, the noise relative to shot noise. So 0 dB right here would be shot noise. Anything below 0 dB is, is squeezing. Anything above it is anti-squeezing. So the long part of the ellipse here, narrow part of the ellipse there. And then at each frequency, we, I've shown you how we are rotating the ellipse. Okay? And now if you extrapolate that to what we would need to do for advanced LIGO, we would have to take this 2 meter long cavity that we built in our labs and turn it into about a 100 meter long cavity to get the frequency right. At advanced LIGO, the rotation needs to happen at 100 hertz, not at a kilohertz as it did in our lab. Okay, so, so, and that's planned. So Advanced LIGO has a planned upgrade coming up in the next two years called A+. And one of the major components of this upgrade after observing run three, possibly four, depending on, on how things work out, is for this kind of frequency dependent squeezing to go in. And then that should give us broadband improvement. Okay? All right. So. If you look at these curves I've shown you before, and part of reaching design and the upgrade are these quantum technologies that I've talked about. OK, so the, the, the squeeze light injection. So I'm going to take a break in a few minutes, but I think I'm going to introduce my next topic first, and then we'll take a break. Because this is, you know, I mean, you're, I'm sure, so amazed by this that we should keep going on that momentum, right? I mean, I, I really can't imagine not being amazed, right? I, I told you something you didn't know. OK, good. That's the, the goal. Have I told you something that wowed you? Good. All right, so now comes the question of radiation pressure. Is it a scourge or is it a force for good? And really, the answer to that question is going to be, it depends. So the first person to tell us that this was a terrible plight and a terrible disease for uh, um, gravitational wave detectors was Carl Caves, who also wrote my all-time most favorite abstract ever. So here is a paper that says, from 1980 that says quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations in an interferometer. And here is the, the punchline. There has been a controversy whether quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations disturb this measurement. This letter resolves the controversy. They do. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to write an abstract like this <laughs> and get it past the referees? <laughs> OK, so Caves already told us that this should be a problem. And by the way, these ideas that I told you earlier on of the vacuum entering the open port and causing shot noise and radiation pressure noise, that all came from Carl Caves, who was at the time in Kip Thorne's group. So, so we owe a big debt to him in thinking about it that way. Because before that, people thought about this as, as a sort of a puzzle of why does the laser noise matter if it's all going back to the laser. And he was the one who first quantified that it's the vacuum that's causing the problems, OK? Uh, the vacuum from the open port that's, ca that's causing the problems. OK, so 
if we can, radiation pressure has many advantages and has some disadvantages. The disadvantage you already know, it's a noise source and it's actually a rather uh, painful and annoying noise source because it limits us and most of our frequency band at low, fr below 100 hertz. On the other hand, you can also use radiation pressure to improve the gravitational wave detector sensitivity. So this is a conundrum. You're going to say, why, how? It's a noise source. But well, I'll show you. And you can also use radiation pressure to do other amazing quantum things. You can observe the quantum radiation pressure noise, of course, that's an that's a amazing thing. And I'll tell you why it's amazing. When you see in an experiment quantum radiation pressure noise, when you measure the motion of an oscillator that's limited by quantum radiation pressure noise, what you are really saying is, I have an object that is ever so slightly being tickled by vacuum, and I can see it. It's pretty amazing. Right? All right, so we can do that. It turns out you can also use radiation pressure to generate squeeze states of light. And then you get all kinds of other quantum, uh, quantum uh, trickeries and tools for quantum information science that I won't talk about, but many people work on as well. Okay, so uh, before the break, let me just set up the radiation pressure um, formalism for you. So the basic picture is this. You have a cavity, there's a laser and there's a mirror, and there's another mirror, and your second mirror in, this, in these calculations is allowed to move. It's a mechanical oscillator with mechanical resonant frequency capital omega sub m, and loss, dissipation, damping, whatever you like to call it, gamma sub m. So that's your mechanical mode. And that couples to an optical mode, which is the cavity mode, which has a frequency omega subcavity, and it also has a decay rate gamma, remember, related to the finesse, which I introduced yesterday. Okay? And in, in, in these, these calculations, you have some, some you, the, the uh, quantum mechanical object. Here, of course, is your, your, the operator for light, and this is your position operator for your mechanics. Okay, and now I've, I've, I'm, I've swept many, many things under the rug because to get to this interaction Hamiltonian takes a, lo a fair amount of work because it's a very nonlinear system. You have to linearize it, etc. So I've swept a bunch of things under the rug, but I put this Hamiltonian up so you can see that it is very. It should remind you very much of the Hamiltonian I put up for the nonlinear uh, optical medium with the squeezer. Basically, what it is is you have two modes. In this case, it happens to be a, a one mechanical mode B and one optical mode A, but it could just as soon have been two optical modes like we had in the nonlinear optics case. And then you can write a coupling term, that's the, this coupling constant G, which actually depends on the, uh, on, on the zero point fluctuations of, of the mechanics compared to the force that the, the optics can apply. Okay, so that's the comparison. How much can you move the mechanics relative to how much can the optics move them? Okay, and with all of that uh, put together, you get this coupled oscillator system where the main thing that you should know is experimentally we have two knobs we like to turn. So the coupling constant depends on the difference between the laser frequency and the cavity frequency, and it depends on, so that we call the detuning, and it depends on the laser power, which is the number of photons. So now we have a way of making an optical cavity that we use all over LIGO, you've seen already, but by simply dialing the power of the laser or dialing how close the laser frequency is to the cavity frequency, I can create an optomechanical system. Okay? And that's the, that's the sort of the setup right there. Now, ours is not the only uh, group in which these things happen. There's an explosion of optomechanics experiments, and, uh, and I've listed them in, in terms of mass scale. But LIGO mirrors are the heaviest at, at you know, 40 kilograms. But you know, people uh, do optomechanics with phononic crystals that are at the picogram scale, and all the way up to, to you know, LIGO, which is at you know, uh, uh, 10 to the uh, 4 gram scale, uh, and everything in between. And I'll just point out a couple of things. Um, uh, after the break, I'm going to tell you about experiments we do with these mechanical systems. And all of the three heaviest ones are from our group. So 
these are, are many other groups in the world, but when it comes to big and heavy, we, we sort of occupy that space. I'm sorry, what's the question? Yeah, so uh, is it good to be he he heavy? So let me just, uh, just, just tell you, that's a good question and I can set the stage uh, uh, for that. So you can think about the mass of the mirror uh, affects the resonant frequency. If you think of them in the simplest, stupidest way, it's K over M, right? So, so you can think of it that way. It's not just quite that simple. And the reason why we, so the heavier the mass, the lower the resonant frequency. And there's no accident that our, the gravitational wave community occupies this heavy end because we need low frequency oscillators. Why do we need low frequency oscillators? Because remember, this is the picture right here. Our free uh, uh, um, uh, falling mass of GR is only true below the res above the resonant frequency. So typically for LIGO, these resonant frequencies for these oscillators are below one hertz. Okay? So there's no accident there that we need to work at the, at the, at the high frequency. On the other hand, Ma the heavier the object, what are you interested in these experiments? In these experiments, you're interested in how much can light pressure move the mirror? So the heavier you make them, the more light you need. And the more light you have, the more headaches you have. So in some sense, it's much more advantageous to go very light and use very little laser power, because then you don't have all the problems of high power absorption, heating, uh, even generating that kind of power. In fact, uh, even destroying mirrors. We regularly take these little uh, uh, um, nanomechanical structures here, and if you put too much laser power, it just vaporizes. So, you know, so, so there are many advantages to being in the, in, in the light regime, but we don't have that option because our gravitational waves occur at these, at these frequencies. So let's take a break and come back in, in, in say, 10 minutes.